Hello, my name is Peter Wuchertin. I'm a software architect based in San Francisco. I am here today with my colleague, Yuval Lowy, author of a new book published by Addison Wesley called Writing Software. Uh, Yuval, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Peter. So I'm a software architect. I'm the founder of iDesign, a company devoted for software design. When we say software design, we mean system design and project design. I've had several ideas that are literally the bedrock of current software development, such as microservices, along with several groundbreaking ideas on process and design and technology. I've published uh, seven titles on designing and building software systems and close to 100 articles. I've mentored thousands of architects all over the world in my ideas uh, and techniques. Microsoft recognized me as a software legend uh, as one of the top experts in the world due to the impact I've had on the industry over the years, something they've only uh, recognized six people so far. Uh, before that, in the late 90s, I was the chief architect of a Fortune 100 company in the Silicon Valley, right here, and I managed the architecture department. Before that, I managed groups and projects and designed uh, large systems. I've been designing systems and projects for almost 30 years. So you all, most projects I worked with, uh, people are saying it's impossible to meet the cost and deadlines. How do we tackle this problem? So let me point out that most people say that it's impossible to also design software. And we just had a discussion on how to design good software. And in a way that ties back to designing projects and meeting your commitments. Most software projects are incapable of meeting the budget and, and quality and uh, schedule is because they don't encapsulate the volatilities. They design against the requirements. So now when the requirements change, your design is out the window. To use an analogy, suppose you want to build a house outside in the country and you hire an architect and a designer house and a, con a contracting company and you say, and they say how long it will take, how much will it cost? And then midway through you decide, I don't really build that house, I want to build that house, but I want to keep the budget and the deadline. They're going to laugh at you, right? Because it's laughable if you change the architecture to keep the same commitments. And so we have to understand the root cause of the inability of meeting your commitments is because you have a flawed architecture. So first, take care of that. The next thing to understand is just as you design the system, you have to design the project to build it. And it's not a separate design effort. It stems from the architecture. As soon as you design the house, you also design how you're going to build it. And the same mental mindset that says, here's how you apply structure and sound engineering principle to system design, I've applied a similar structure to the act of designing the project itself. So you all, how is the project design different than project management? Okay, so th that's a common misconception. Project design is not project management. Project design to project management is exactly what architecture is to programming. Architecture is the blueprint of the system. You give it to developers and you say you have to build this. Project design provides a plan and you give it to a project manager and you say execute this or manage this. So how do you design a project? So first of all, you have to understand there is no the project. So with any given system, there's many ways of building it. And so instead of talking about a project, you can talk about options for building the system. In an extreme, if I have a 10 million project, I can build it with one person over 10 years or with 3,650 people for one day and anything in between. So there's always options for building a system. Now, if you think about these options, all of them offer some kind of a trade of time and cost and risk. And in a nutshell, what we do when we do project design is we model each of these options as a network of activities that reflect dependency between the activities based on the architecture. It's all coming out of the architecture. It's not done in the void. And we walk into this uh, network of activities, the availability of the resources and constraints you put on the project, and you start forking out of it various options. Then for each of these options, we calculate the duration, the cost, and even the risk. Yes, you can even quantify the risk of that option. And then you offer decision makers the ability to make educated decisions on these options. This seems to take a very long time. How does it, how, from your perspective and from your experience, how long does it take? It actually doesn't take long to do it if you know what you're doing, which is actually true in life in general. If you know what you're doing, things don't take long. So with practice, project design should take about a few days even for a large project. Now, it may take you time to gather the planning assumption and the constraints on the project. Those you have to understand. I mean, if you have the wrong constraints, you will come up with the wrong set of options. But with the constraints and the uh, planning assumption in place, it takes a few days. What is the objective of the project design? The objective is fundamentally to drive educated decisions, meaning can we even afford doing the project? And if so, how do you want to build it? And 
This is typical in life. When you want to build your house out in the country, the first question of the architect is going to be not do you like Victorian or modern, they're going to be how much money you have, right? Because nobody would design a system you can't even afford. Now, in software projects, we may do it the other way around, but at the end of the day, we have to answer the question, do we even want to do the project? Now, if you want to do the project, how are you, going to, how are you actually going to do it? Now, that requires to be able to quantify the risk and the cost and the schedule. And most of the projects are so incredibly complex, you have to take uh, these ability to quantify and calculate these things. Note, I'm not saying estimating, I'm saying calculating it as a way of driving the educated decisions of how to do the project. Now, the ultimate objective here is to get a fighting chance on doing the project. It doesn't mean you're going to succeed, but at least you're getting a fighting chance. If you don't do this, you will for surely fail. It doesn't matter how smart are the developers and how good is the technology. If you don't have enough time or money to build the system, you're going to fail. And so choosing the best option for building the system gives you a fighting chance. You still have to fight, but it gives you the best fighting chance. So when did you start uh, designing projects using your ideas and techniques, and what's your actual track record? So even though in the book I'm showing a complete methodology, the methodology actually evolved over time. However, from day one it never occurred to me to build a software system without architecture or without a plan. So I was always in the context of working with an architecture and a plan. Now through the first part of the 90s, I started applying projects as networks and started tracking against uh, that network. And then over the next 20 years, in the early 80s, I started working with customers all over the world and I perfected quantifying the risk, making that as a planning tool. And I completed the methodology the way readers can see it in the book. Now, I have to stress that every project I was ever involved in shipped on schedule, on budget, with zero defects. And I know it sounds outlandish and far-fetched, but this is what these ideas actually give you. These ideas are incredibly repeatable. It has nothing to do with me personally. And this is something that you would recognize in any other engineering discipline. And over the years, I've helped many ideas and customers achieve the same results. How do you find the management reacts to your approach and your ideas? Managers absolutely love these ideas. And the reason, if you look at most software management, software project management, management actually is flying blind. They have no idea how long things will take, how much will it cost, if you should have done it in the first place. And if you think about business people, about their mentality, business people like to make decisions based on planning, based on budgeting. And it's a fair expectation on their part that the software professionals would rise to the plate and be able to meet their expectations. But they don't actually see that. And that leads to an enormous amount of friction and frustration and animosity between these two groups. And ultimately to failure because without enough time or money or doing something with time and money but it's too risky, you actually fail. And then you've got this vicious cycle where the business people don't trust the technical people and so on. Once you start designing projects, you start building trust. Most of the projects suffer from a chronic deficit in trust. But when you start designing the project and start presenting options to management, you're sending a message. You're saying, I'm trustworthy. I'm accountable for what I'm doing, right? And that's another thing. Management don't respect developers because they don't do these things. They don't just respect architects because they don't do these things. But we live in a world where respect rises out of accountability. Now, if you start doing these things, it leads to trust. When they trust you, they stop micromanaging you. When they stop micromanaging you, they get out of your hair and let you do things correctly. So it's all a positive feedback loop once you start doing these things. And I have to point out that it's the fault of uh, uh, the software professionals, the architect, the developers, who do not design projects. The management have to basically dictate the terms of the project. Now, of course, any chance that the dictates is going to be accurate is purely accidental, and so is your chances of success. Of course, on the opposite spectrum of that, you have developers, techies, and all that. How do they take on this technique and these ideas? It turns out that developers hate uncertainty. Developers like to know there's a plan. They like to know there's leadership. Developers do not like the desk match because the alternative to doing project design is an endless desk match. You may call it in different names, but a rose by any other rose is still a desk match. And so when developers realize there's a steering hand, there's some principle behind it, that these commitments are real, they would also feel more committed. You see, if you just dictate a deadline, the developers don't feel committed for it because it's some arbitrary management uh, uh, dictate. There's nothing to do with reality. But if they trust the numbers and they know it's doable, they would actually pull their weight. 
So things change all the time. How do we actually deal with it? So it's important to understand that project design is not a crystal ball. It's not you will design a project and that's how reality is going to be. I said at the beginning, all it gives you is a fighting chance. Out of the set of options that we have and the constraints as we know it today, this is the best decision we can make. Now, as soon as you start executing, indeed, things will actually change. In which point you have to track against the plan, identify when a trend of uh, deviation from the plan happens, and put corrective action against it, basically right uh, the ship again. And so I actually show it in the book. I show how to track against the plan. But this is also real life. In real life, you have some grand ideas. You're going to study something. You're going to work. You're going to uh, get married. Be a software architect. Be a software architect. And then you execute against that plan and you make small correction against that plan. And that's basically how you should need to do it. But you have no fighting chance whatsoever if you have no plan for your life, right? You end up in a cardboard box in the street if that's your approach for life, okay? And so project design gives you the, the initial fighting chance. And then when the fighting starts, it gives you a firmer reference to, to track against and take the corrective actions. So whose job is to design the project? It's the job of the software architect. Now, think of project design as a continuous design effort. You design the system, and then you design the project to build it. It's a continuous, there's no intermission, it's a continuous effort. Now, architects like to design things, and so let them design things. And project design, and I show it in the book, is a highly engineered task. It requires calculation, it requires structure. It's not something they teach in MBA schools or in PMP classes. It's also true that the architect is the only person in the team with the skills and the insight to actually do project design. The architect understands what are the riskier part of the architecture, how long things should probably take, who is the more uh, capable team member, and so on. It's also by elimination. Who should do it? Would developers do it? No, developers want to code. Should managers do it? No, managers want to be managers. So who's left? It's the architect. Now, the project design no, doesn't stay with the architect. The architect gives the project design to the project manager to execute. And even during the project design, the architect has to work with the project manager on producing the project design. But that's no different when the architect is working on the architecture. You also have to work with marketing or with the product manager on producing the architecture. Okay? So it, it's not a, a siloed effort. You do it in context with other stakeholders in the project, but ultimately, it's a job of the architect. Well, thank you, Val. I've uh, learned a lot and it's very ins inspiring to hear and uh, I hope the others in our industry you know, embrace this book and write the software. Thank you. For me, uh, writing this book and publishing it um, is the culmination of almost 30 years of working in the software industry and I was personally very fortunate to always be at the right place at the right time to see what works, what doesn't to be part even as a junior architect of part of, of massive uh, efforts uh, to be part of cultures of excellence, which allowed me to experiment with these ideas. And for me, the, the book is, is almost a way of paying back uh, to the industry. So thank you. Thank you.